All right, so this is Unit 1, Philosophical and Historical Foundations of the American Political System. The question we have is the first one. Why did the founders prefer a Republican form of government to a democracy? Does such a sentiment exist today? Explain your response. As James Wilson wrote, representation is the chain of communication between the people and their leaders. This chain may consist of one or more links, but in all cases, it should be sufficiently strong and discernible. The founders desired a government of popular sovereignty, but one that left space between public opinion and policy. The founders' skepticism of democracy came from both ancient and modern sources. Their classical education exposed them to the Athenian mob and Roman demagogues. Raising their eyes from their books, they would have seen raucous state politics, where men of low social standing rose to power overnight on promises of paper money and debt relief. Republican meritocracy was seen as a cure for democratic excess. Madison advocated such a process of elections as will extract from the mass of society the purest and noblest characters it contains. This natural aristocracy would seek the common good within the legitimate mandate of public approval. The Anti-Federalists howled in protest. They believed, in the words of Federal Farmer, that what was needed was not brilliant talents, but a sameness between representative and constituents. The Anti-Federalists may have lost a constitutional battle, but their populist philosophy certainly carried the day. Historian Gordon Wood hypothesized that the revolution unleashed egalitarian forces the framers could not contain. Wave after wave of democratization has brought the expansion of the franchise, the 17th Amendment, the tethering of electors to state popular votes, and the post-Watergate sunshine laws. As Alexis de Tocqueville noted, each new concession strengthens the democracy, and its demands increase with its strength. As the frontier stretched west, states carried democracy even further with term limits, judicial elections, and ballot initiatives. For much of our history, political parties with a vertical leadership structure provided an accidental republicanism our founders didn't anticipate. However, even parties are now democratized, as seen with the elimination of superdelegates from the Democratic primary. As we subtract links from the chain, bringing institutions closer to the people, we grapple with the idea that good policy can require insulation from politics. Fearful that elected officials will deliver an inflationary sugar high, we ask the Federal Reserve to make monetary policy and take away the candy bowl. Today, the chain of representation is shorter than ever, but satisfaction has not increased. Instead, there is a feeling that policy has slipped farther from the public's control. Unfortunately, reforms that could increase institutional knowledge and make government more effective such as raising the pay of regulators and lifting term limits, is difficult to sell to an anti-federalist public. The anti-federalist distrust of elites affects not just our institutions, but our civic culture. Every president since Bill Clinton has run as a transformative outsider, but public disgust only grows. We blame this on a lack of civic dispositions. Research by Hibbing and Moore shows a massive failure of the public to appreciate democratic pluralism. Most Americans seem to believe that political problems have obvious answers with consensus support. So politicians who fail to implement these easy answers must be incompetent or corrupt. Thus, politicians are held to an impossible standard. Based on this research, the civic disposition that requires the most work is the recognition of diverse viewpoints. As Hibbing and Morse write, our educational system needs to work harder at teaching students to appreciate the difficulty of democratic decisions. Reaching good solutions takes time, energy, and even conflict. If citizens expect democracy to be smooth sailing, they are bound to be disappointed. Thank you. We are now ready for your questions. Fantastic. Okay, so requires conflict. Let's just start with where you ended. Um, what did the founders, how did the founders see human nature and that we are, in con we are naturally oriented towards conflict, and how does the Constitution try to make the best of that? So the founders drew a lot on the works of classical and Greek um, political scientists, such as Aristotle, who famously remarked that man is a political animal, and this is really where this idea begins. And um, from being a political animal, there's naturally going to be this conflict between people trying to discern what the best form of politics would be. So um, this was kind of uh, translated into the very beginnings of the government, into the Philadelphia Convention. And, okay. and we can see that they implemented checks and balances into our system, most notably 
they agreed that structural protections were necessary to prevent abuses of power. We can see, I think Robert Dahl argued that republicanism was not about the importance of civic virtue, but just it also took into account the fragility of virtue. Mm. And I think the founders took that into consideration when creating our government systems. How easy it is to lose it, right? And so how, did, how does the Constitution protect against that? Or is it a matter of the Constitution? Is it a matter of other things that are not written in the Constitution, but are in the spirit of the laws and in the way that we conduct ourselves as a, as a country, as a nation, for all these years since? Well, Madison famously remarked that um, enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. So uh, we, had to, <laughs> thanks, we, we had to create a system of government that would be able to persist through times of rocky leadership and corrupt politicians. Mm -hmm. So they implemented a lot of structural checks upon each branch of government and uh, systems like federalism and individual rights in order to be able to place a check on any governmental branch or agency that grew too large in its control. We also see uh, Madison having uh, talking about uh, factions in his Federalist 10 and acknowledging the fact that there are many citizens with diverse points of view and acknowledging that there, are, there should, that factions are a way that we can uh, come together and not come together, but um, factions are a way that we can build on our diverse points of views. So you cite uh, the, the progressive reforms of the last century, initiative referendum uh, recall, as examples of the wave of democratization. I think that's probably correct. Can, can you tell me how Madison, well, how would the founders uh, have seen that? And were those, were those movements a mistake? I think that the founders were definitely more fearful of di direct democracy than uh, citizens of the United States are today. I think that there can be great risk in the um, increased trend towards ballot initiatives especially. With um, We can see in California, they pass uh, mountains of ballot initiatives and sometimes uh, as constitutional amendments and they can be contradictory towards each other and end up in constitutional paradoxes such as when they passed constitutional um, ballot initiative amendments to both have a balanced budget and not do deficit spending, but then also to allocate certain amounts of money towards specific governmental programs. And these two constitutional amendments weren't able to coexist together. So with a public that may not be um, properly educated on all of the issues, it can be dangerous to be able to have this power with ballot initiatives. And this is especially the case today where in terms of civics education, we are the best. And even during the time of the founding, while education was something they championed as seen with the Northwest Ordinance and the high literacy rates during the time, they were still fearful of this a more direct democracy. Um, hearing your story, you seem to be describing a swinging, a balance, a swing back and forth between uh, emphasis on the Republican virtues and, and of the democratic virtues, and they both have values. I think we would, if I understand what you said, we're probably saying we have moved strongly towards the democratic populist direction right now. Where will we be moving in five years? Well, one thing that we've seen uh, recently is a bunch of states joining a coalition in order to render the Electoral College ineffective and join to make the winner of the national popular vote win the states who joins electoral votes and there are currently 12 states that have joined with Colorado being the most recent and I think that we can see um, a trend towards devaluing the electoral college and moving more towards democracy in this way. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? I think that there are a lot of um, benefits towards the original intention of the electoral college with the filtration of talent but I don't know whether or not uh, devaluing small states in such a way would be uh, too detrimental towards our system. We don't want to devalue um, people in West Virginia who might not be uh, campaigned in if we get rid of the Electoral College. But people, I mean, I lived in, when I lived in Kentucky, nobody ever campaigned in Kentucky because it was a late, I mean, it, it didn't matter. Uh, after the primaries, nobody cares who wins South Carolina. It just doesn't matter. So I live, when we live in North Carolina, it mattered a lot, much bigger state. So why does the increased 
why does moving to a um, direct election of president, why does that make it less democratic? Because if you vote in South Carolina, you vote whoever you want to, we don't care. Well, oftentimes um, politicians don't campaign as much in the smaller states because uh, the Finish your, finish your uh, because these states are more solidly red or blue, this is one of the large issues with the electoral college. Politicians don't see as much need to campaign in states if it's seen as secure after the primaries. So I would count this more as an issue towards why politicians are ignoring some of these states rather than just their size alone. All right. in secondary literature was really impressive and it was enjoyable. You know, it didn't seem like you were just grabbing things here and there to add to your presentation. You found the most germane parts of what other people have been saying, writing about the Constitution and you brought it into your own <coughs> your own point of view. It was very good. Yeah. And just that, like I said, enjoyable. So I was very impressed. A um, couple things that I really wanted to draw attention to. Your comment that the anti-federalists lost the battle but won the war is basically correct, I think. Uh, we moved in the direction, that, uh, at least with respect to the democratization aspect. Maybe the strong central government is something that really has to go away. <laughs> but, uh, but at least with respect to the democratization, which is the point you were making, I think that was right. Um, and one of the points you made about even our political parties have become democratized. Now this would be a point, if I had all day, I could now launch into my lecture about how this has been one of the major problems with uh, our uh, political process, is the way we treated our political parties. Uh, and uh, you know, I think most people don't notice that, and uh, uh, I, I thought that was very insightful uh, on your part. Um, and I also, uh, I, people lose sight of the Northwest Ordinance too, and I thought your comment about the Northwest Ordinance was really, really well done. And the Electoral College thing, that is a deep tough issue. And um, I'm not quite sure where it's all going to go. Uh, and you can understand there are good arguments on both sides. And that makes for uh, it gives us something to talk about. Nice work. Yeah. You brought in a number of extremely interesting, important issues. The yeah, the beginning quotation that representation is a chain of communication. I thought that was a, a brilliant way to begin this whole, this whole discussion. I didn't want to take issue with your assumptions about um, the Electoral College uh, and moving to uh, a more democratic all state because if I vote for a democratic candidate for president in South Carolina, it's deep, that vote is not ever going to count, at least not until not unless the whole electoral map changes. On the other hand, if I vote, if, uh, if South Carolina were going to vote for the way that it's going to cast this vote with the majority, that vote could just count the whole mass, then it would count as much as somebody voting for New York State or California. So I think that is one of the issues. Uh, that makes it not an obvious good or bad, but, but part of the motivation behind it. Brought some really interesting, important, and complex issues that we should have more time to discuss. Thank you. <laughs>